We developed a nano quadrotor capable of agile flight. In a lab at the University of Pennsylvania, it's hard to know if this is the work of manic hobbyists or level-headed scientists. Drones attract both. Multiple vehicles can fly as a formation. What we do know is that the technology making unmanned flight possible is getting smaller and is evolving at breathtaking speed. The team can also navigate in environments with obstacles. Here's what we know: I'm cheaper, better, faster. Thanks to these things in our pockets, thanks to smartphones、um, and we controllers and you know other consumer electronics, we have all the necessary elements to create、um, a drone. This has just happened over the past、uh, four or five years. This is a, a technology that's a game changer.、Uh, it's been so on the military side; it will be the same on the civilian side. For many Americans, drones have been a controversial weapon prowling over foreign battlegrounds, targeting and striking the enemy. But as the military campaigns wind down, the drones are coming home. This is a powerful technology. It is real. It is coming. No amount of hand wringing is going to stop it. The technology is being reborn in swarms of ingenious mainstream hardware, drones of all shapes, sizes, and uses. Anything from an opportunistic snap of a celebrity to crime fighting to government surveillance. My problem is once you start with this, it doesn't stop, and I'm very concerned we're at the beginning of a revolution in surveillance、uh, that will not stop. Just as wireless and mobiles reshape the way we live our lives, drones are looming as the next big game changer. And flying alongside them are important questions about safety, security, and privacy. And who will be at the controls? This is what happens when they're in the hands of some airborne anarchists. Team Black Sheep, the bad boys of a growing garage drone movement, are barnstorming their way across America, buzzing the nation's most treasured landmarks, then posting their audacious missions online. What? I mean, part of what we do is is,、uh, is is try to stir up controversy. I mean, just just to to show what can be done with these drones.、Um, you have to cross certain boundaries to actually do that. To to show people、um, the 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 technology is here. Now, this was filmed from a、uh, RC plane, a remote controlled plane soaring high over the city. Their most controversial mission was across New York skyline, getting under the nose of Miss Liberty herself. For some New Yorkers, it was an outrage exposing big holes in city security. It went viral in the in in the internet, and the whole thing just exploded. All the news networks were covering it, but I think the. The connection between 9/11,、um, the huge security surrounding the Statue of Liberty, and someone just flying a plane over the statue, kind of also showed that the security there is, is really a little bit of a circus. But I think what struck most people is 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 that that it was actually possible. For years, conventional hobbyists have been allowed to fly model planes, as long as they stay below 400 feet, away from populated areas, and aren't used for commercial purposes. But this is very different: a remote control range stretching to the horizon and beyond, autopilot GPS, and the all-seeing live stream camera. 
In America, this kind of flying is illegal. But in three years' time, the US will open up its skies to drones. Well, we basically we use um, a modified uh, re remote control receiver and a video transmitter, which is down here, together with the video camera. And uh, with that, we can fly um, about 10 miles with, 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 with these kind of uh, antennas. I mean, you, you could basically go further if you, if you change some antennas around. Team leader Raphael Perker doesn't actually live in the US. When not launching drone raids across America, he's back home in the sanctuary of Switzerland. I think that the commercial applications are just too overwhelming to have any draconian rules against them. Yeah, I mean, I, I see it that within three or four years, the drones will actually be flying alongside normal aircraft. Out in the New Mexico desert, motorists are being watched oblivious to the fact that they're in the crosshairs of a Reaper, the most formidable military drone flying today. We don't want to get too close so he can hear us. This is just an exercise for student drone pilots at Holloman Air Base in New Mexico. The US Air Force is in the midst of radical change, now training more drone pilots than fighter pilots. We've got movement on the vehicle. Continue your search along the roads to the north and south of that river. It's extraordinary global technology. These trainees are learning to be fully-fledged military operators, making remote life-and-death decisions, flying missile-armed drones on the other side of the world. So I have the opportunity to go to work, fly a mission, uh, no matter where it is, do the job, and then I put on a different hat and I come home to my wife and my kids. This is not a video game. This is real life and we train our folks to make this real life. This makes a big difference. This is a force multiplier and I tell you there are more troops on the ground that are alive today because of this airplane. But increasingly, they're also a force multiplier for other government agencies. Nine unarmed military-style drones, almost identical to these Reapers, already fly for the US Customs and Border Patrol, hunting for illegal immigrants. Last year, one was called in to help a North Dakota sheriff catch cattle rustlers. Now, the possibilities seem endless. <laughs> To get a taste of what's now on offer in the domestic drone market, all roads lead to Las Vegas, which is hosting the world's largest convention of unmanned aerial vehicles, as the experts like to call them. Bright light city, gonna set my soul, gonna set my soul on fire. Got a whole lot of money that's ready to burn, so get those stakes up higher. Here there are drones for every purpose, from emergency response to monitoring farm stock. There's one message. If it's dirty, dangerous or dull, get a drone to do it. Obviously this airframe can also be utilized in uh, law enforcement, disaster relief, industrial applications. In addition to all the capabilities, it's also very good at dusting the floors. Every homeowner should have one of these in their house. These salespeople are working to a congressional order that domestic airspace be opened up to civilian drones by 2015, a deadline now fueling a multi-billion dollar market. So the entire unit can easily fit in a single rucksack. It's estimated that a staggering 30,000 drones of all shapes and sizes could be buzzing around American skies by 2020. So I imagine night vision is pretty important in terms of your guys' perspective, right? I mean, night, night. Domestic police forces are already taking off. Aerovironment, which builds 85% of the U.S. military's small drones, has been quick to launch its first cop drone, the Cube. 
I can say that in the U.S. alone, there are something on the order of 18,000 local law enforcement agencies, and about 99% of them don't have any kind of aviation unit. So that represents a pretty big market opportunity just here, and that's just law enforcement. When you layer in fire departments, hazardous materials teams, search and rescue teams, agriculture, security, and even commercial applications like pipeline inspection, it could become a significant market, and it's global in nature. The sales pitch is compelling. I have a visual on a suspect. Why buy a $2 million police helicopter when a $20,000 quad rotor can chase down the bad guys? Suspect moving to the northeast side of the house. With GPS, autopilot and a live video feed to police smartphones, they can run, but they can't hide. It's very exciting and it's, the, the future is uh, going to be uh, special. It will be a, a benefit to law enforcement. I would say it's a force multiplier in that you're able to do uh, use technology to use less people. You walk through this uh, trade show and you realize the future is here. It's now. And uh, all this exists. It's just working through the, the bureaucracies and the politics and, and the community engagement of, of operating these domestically. But with the swarm building, who will keep order in the skies? The Federal Aviation Administration has the job of making America's drone age a reality. Leading robotics expert Dr Peter Singer reckons the regulators are way behind reality. Congress, though, has said 2015 FAA, figure it out. Figure out how to allow all this to happen. The problem is the FAA is a agency that essentially deals with airspace management. It's thinking about things like, how do we make sure these micro drones don't crash into other planes? But that misses all sorts of the other political, legal, ethical issues that play out with this. Everything from how do we ensure rights of privacy to what way should the police be allowed to use them, what way should they not be allowed to use them, to how do we keep bad actors from utilizing these technologies. What the autopilot does is stabilize the vehicle in the air. Drones are first and foremost surveillance platforms, and that worries both civil liberties groups and conservative pundits who now fear flying police cameras above every backyard barbecue. This is not what we want. I would say you but you ban it under all circumstances. And I would predict, I'm not encouraging, but I'm predicting the first guy who uses a Second Amendment weapon to bring a drone down that's been hovering over his house is going to be a folk hero in this country. I think people may take uh, the law into their own hands. But I say that really tongue-in-cheek. I do think this is a country that really does value its freedom above everything else. <laughs> Syndicated columnist and conservative commentator Charles Krauthammer is leading the charge against the rise of the machines. And I think people will see this as something of a threat. I mean, there's already this sort of discomfort with Google Street View, where you see your own house, and I've seen my house, and you can locate the car in the driveway. So we already know that goes on, and uh, I don't want anything buzzing over my house, and I think most Americans don't either. I would begin with a ban and nibble away from there. I'm really afraid that once we open the floodgates... Look, people argue you have helicopters that can follow you. Yes, but helicopters are big, they're loud, they're expensive, and they're dangerous. So you can't possibly keep them up there all the time. They go up for a car chase or somebody on the loose, and then you bring them down. With drones, everything changes. It's like having a permanent camera over everybody's head in every street forever. Now we're in a space where they're going to be able to pick up a lot of things that they may not have that warrant for. And so it's akin to some of the monitoring of, of email. We then have to figure out when can they do that, when can't they, what do they do with all that information that they're gathering when they may be monitoring one person but they're picking up all the data on all the others. Do they have to throw it away or can they also sift through that data and try and find bad things? We're, we're, we're not ready for this world and yet that's what we're moving into.
Under pressure to cut costs, media organisations are also taking a keen interest in drone technology. Some are already pushing the envelope. Here, online news site thedaily.com defies the current ban on media flights by launching a few drones of its own to cover a big story on floods in the American South. Here in Natchez, Mississippi, this drone video, exclusive to the Daily, gives a unique aerial view of the struggle to keep the water at bay. It allows a whole universe of new possibilities, you know, things that are very positive. Let's just take reporting as an example. We're going to see um, journalists use this to gather all sorts of stories. We've already seen examples such as um, reporting from natural disasters when there was flooding in one place. They popped up a little drone that monitored what happened in a way that the news wouldn't have been able to cover it before to um, documenting issues of abuse. Uh, there's been a couple protests where they have put up little tiny drones to monitor whether the police were going to commit abuses against the protesters. But, of course, there's a flip side to that. Um, Paparazzi using these, um, following people in a way that we um, wouldn't want to see or violates their rights of privacy. In the drone age, where there's a celebrity, you'll probably find a prying lens hovering nearby. Paparazzi drones are yet to take off in a big way in the United States, but they are already stalking America's beautiful people on the French Riviera. Pour voler la plage en elle-même, théoriquement, il faudrait demander une autorisation, mais là, ça va pas être le cas. En fait, on va la contourner. Celebrity socialite Paris Hilton, among the first to be targeted by a remote control, high-flying lens. Voyez pas Hilton? Non. Essaye d'aller plus loin si tu peux. The drone returned with more than a hundred photos. Unnerved by the new technology, Paris Hilton's bodyguards attempted to seize the craft. However they're used, drones are becoming a very big business very quickly. Chris Anderson is editor-in-chief of the tech head Bible, Wired magazine. The size of the industry, you know, it's billions of dollars. I think $30 billion by 2015 was, was one estimate I've seen. Anderson sees a future with a drone in every home. Just as the Silicon Valley hotshots once brashly predicted a computer on every desktop. So in the same way that Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak in the 1970s looked at computers, which were then mainframes, IBM, etc., and said, you know what, these chips are now available. Let's take computers away from big companies and governments and give them to people, the Apple to um, ultimately the Mac. That's democratizing technology. It's taking technology and giving it to regular people to find new uses. And we're at the moment when we can do the same thing with drone technology. Chris Anderson isn't just writing about the drone phenomenon, he's making it happen. He owns the San Diego factory, which mass produces drone autopilots, and they're flying out the door. A few hundred dollars buys you membership of a booming do-it-yourself drone network. Today, there's more drones out there being flown by hobbyists than there are by the military. Tens of thousands of these of members of our community and thousands of these drones that, uh, that use our autopilot out there, used by everything from children to college students to, you know, companies, NASA, um, etc., all but, you know, all non-military purposes. For more than six years, I've talked on the air about creating a social network. But down in Texas, there's anger over what might soon appear over the cattle ranch or pickup truck. Controversial radio shock jock Alex Jones rallied gun enthusiasts in this online call to arms. Recently, the federal government has announced that 30,000 drones are to be deployed in the skies of America. So we return to Steiner Ranch to shoot down a few drones of our own. You're going to see corporations and stalkers using these systems to harass people. 
Why don't we get together as Americans and reaffirm our Bill of Rights and Constitution and politically shoot down this out-of-control Big Brother drone rollout? Texan drone control aside, drone advocates concede sorting out the safety issues needs a lot of work. As an example of what's potentially ahead, this is what happens when new age meets old in the airspace of Afghanistan. A close encounter between a military drone and an airliner. Understandably, in the busy skies over the United States, airline pilots are appalled by the prospect of sharing space with thousands of unmanned machines. Unmanned aircraft also have a much higher crash rate. So what happens when a drone simply falls out of the sky? The copters, the various sorts, multi-copters, four, six, eight blades, or single blades, etc., uh, those can be more dangerous. They really are sort of flying lawnmowers in a sense. It's funny because the safety issues are usually treated either as um, in a hysterical manner or in a manner that's a little bit like the ostrich with their head in the sand. Um, so the hysterical manner is, you know, the idea that you're going to have hundreds of thousands of these systems all flying about constantly crashing and or constantly being used by terrorists or constantly being used in some way that's just Armageddon coming. It's robo Armageddon. Or you hear the, don't worry about it, they're really, really small. So even if they crash, it won't matter. That's just, frankly, ignores the laws of physics. They go, oh, but it's just a, you know, le less than a hundred pounds. Well, go up to the top of a 10 story building and take a hundred pound piece of metal and drop it and see if it causes some damage. That's a concern. We're driving really right through the heart of Manhattan Beach, California. Homes probably range from, I would say, three million uh, to a recent sale at sixteen million dollars. With one of the world's busiest airports in his city. Los Angeles real estate agent Ed Kaminsky is never too far away from the buzz of passenger aircraft and many of the world's best-known celebrities. Hey, Bernie. How's it going? Good, are you? Good. So here's what I want to do today. Can you get up high enough to see that they're not touching on the sides or just fly down the, the property line a little bit, something like that? Hey, this is Ed Kaminsky from Shorewood Realtors, and we're checking in here from Rancho Palos Verdes, California. And we're going to take you on a flight around this spectacular property. The home. It's still illegal to use drones for commercial purposes, but Ed Kaminsky is comfortable with what he's doing. And interestingly, no authority has stepped in to stop him. So take a look right now. Obviously, our sellers who own the properties love it that we're creating this perspective for the buyers. The buyers seem to really like it because now they can really get a feel of the property without having to go there. We're not using it for anything that would, I think, abuse privacy or go above height limits as far as airspace goes. So for what we use it for, we're not violating any of those issues. And that's what I focus on is what we're doing is right. You know, what other people do, I can't control. And what of the future? Well, it's going to be even smaller and smarter. If it flaps like a bird, it might just be a hummingbird drone. Well, something the size of the hummingbird could conceivably provide customers with a pocketable unmanned aircraft system. And as we look at the military market, which is the largest adopter of this technology today, that idea of making something a standard issue as a, uh, as a sidearm, for example, or a helmet, uh, it certainly interests a lot of people. But not all small drones are so benign. Aerovironment, creator of the Hummingbird and the unarmed Cube Cop drone, has also quietly developed another nasty surprise. 
It's called the switchblade. It's a um, cross between a drone and a munition, um, or rather what you would call it is a robotic kamikaze. Um, it's uh, about the size of a rolled up um, magazine. Uh, a soldier can shoot it off, it flies, observes, and then rather than having to call Big Brother then to fly in and drop bombs on the target, in this case the little tiny drone, they can then decide now it's going to turn into a little cruise missile and fly into the target. Back in the lab at the University of Pennsylvania, the drones come in peace. Here, they're being marshaled to play the James Bond theme. Cute, clever, but what to make of them out in the real world? You wouldn't be flying high overhead, but able to zoom down and do things what they call perch and stare. I mean, imagine a bird landing on your windowsill and peeking in. The drones are taking off. The question is, do we have the ability to harness a technology now evolving at phenomenal speed? Can society keep up? Moore's law is the idea that our technology, particularly our microchips, has doubled in its power and capacity just about every 18 months or so. Moore's law, though, doesn't stop. If Moore's law holds true the way it's held true over the last 40 years, within 25 years, our technologies will be a billion times more powerful than today. Music 